In the previous two themes, we considered the endogeneity problem, which is a um, quite serious failure of the assumptions of the classical uh, linear regression model. So in the following theme, uh, we will look into other two types of failures, namely heteroscedasticity and uh, autocorrelation. And in this uh, first video lesson, I will then introduce you the concepts of heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation and uh, what kind of consequences there are for the statistical properties. So firstly, let's focus on uh, heteroscedasticity for a moment. Um, so recall from the theme number three, when we discussed the statistical assumptions of the linear regression model, uh, one of the assumptions was uh, homoscedasticity, which was stating that uh, the variance of the error term epsilon is constant across all observations. So uh, heteroscedasticity is uh, uh, generally defined as the failure of this assumption. So if homoscedasticity doesn't hold, then we have a heteroscedastic uh, error term. So heteroscedasticity is just uh, refers to the, that, uh, that the variance is not the same across all observations. And in this particular case, we of course talk about the variance of the error term epsilon. So what kind of possible causes there might be for heteroscedasticity? So in general, of course, there is no particular reason why the variance of the error term should be constant across all the observations. But before going to the testing or modeling of heteroscedasticity, it may be good to first rule out some, some uh, possible model misspecification. So sometimes, for example, if you have a, have a um, wrong functional form, so for example, you are fitting a linear model, but uh, actually uh, the true relationship between X and Y variables would be nonlinear. So then uh, this kind of... Uh, um, model misspecification or functional form misspecification might uh, might appear as if it is heteroscedasticity, while in fact it's it's more a question of model misspecification. Uh, another type of misspecification might be also that uh, uh, in principle in the uh, linear regression model we assume that the error term epsilon uh, uh, enters the model in an additive form, so we have plus epsilon as the last uh, last term, but um, it could be also that uh, that the multiplicative formulation might be more appropriate, like in this uh, red color formula that I have indicated here. So then in that kind of situation, it might help to then use the logarithm transformation to the to the to the model. So in the blue formulation, I have then take a natural logarithm of both sides of equation. And then after the logarith logarithmic transformation, then the error term enters now in an additive form. So in fact, indeed, the use of logarithm is often motivated by the fact that, uh, that uh, we want to have this kind of um, uh, formulation where the, uh, where the error is proportionate to the size of the units, whatever countries or, or companies or, or whatever units we have. So, but, but uh, still there might be, of course, other, other types of other reasons for the heteroscedasticity problems. So in order to understand that, is it something heteroscedasticity related to the uh, misspecification of the functional form or potentially multiplicative form, it may be a good starting point to first uh, uh, make some kind of uh, scatter plot of your data. And this is the uh, scatter plot of the housing market example that we have considered. So this is the SPO. Uh, housing market data. We have the size in square meters on horizontal axis and the price on the vertical axis. And uh, the blue dots represent the observed uh, apartments in the in the data set. So notice that uh, if you if you would fit the line to this uh, in the middle of this data, so notice that the variation in the price is uh, very small at the in the small apartments with the let's say 30 square meters. But if, if as we move to the bigger apartments, when, when we have uh, more than 100 square meters, then, then there is already very large variance in the, in the price. So this could be the, the example that I mentioned about this uh, uh, additive versus multiplicative error terms. So perhaps in this kind of example, it would be, would be more meaningful to model the uh, 
uh, error term proportional to the size of apartment rather than as, a, as an additive form. And indeed, uh, if you have the additive error term, then, uh, then we, we would have here then potentially some heteroscedasticity. So in my experience, this is a very typical pattern you see in uh, empirical data that uh, that uh, variance of the of the error term tends to increase with the size of the unit, whatever way the size is is measured. So, what are then the implications of uh, heteroscedasticity? So. Um, we know in theory that uh, that uh, or in least cost estimator uh, remains still unbiased and it is consistent uh, uh, even if we have heteroscedasticity. So uh, point here is that uh, we didn't need to use the assumption of homoscedasticity in any way when we were proving the property of unbiasedness. Consistency we didn't really prove, but unbiasedness we did prove, and uh, homoscedasticity didn't really play any any role. So in that respect, uh, heteroscedasticity is uh, not nearly so serious problem as endogeneity, because the OLS estimator is still unbiased and consistent. So there is not any systematic bias. And uh, as the sample size increases, then the OLS estimator becomes uh, more and more precise. So uh, what are the two, two uh, adverse consequences of uh, heteroscedasticity? Firstly, uh, there may be more efficient estimators than OLS if uh, if uh, we explicitly do model the heteroscedasticity, and I will discuss that in the uh, in the later lessons of this theme. But perhaps even more serious uh, problem is that uh, heteroscedasticity would affect the standard errors that we that we calculate and. Uh, in, in the case of heteroscedasticity, the standard errors might overestimate or they might underestimate the variance. And as a result, then the statistical tests or the confidence intervals are not any more reliable. So for many purposes, the failure of the statistical inferences can be a more serious consequence of uh, heteroscedasticity. So why, why we need to also take heteroscedasticity seriously. So it's not so much affecting the point estimates, but uh, but for the uh, for the inferences, it can be detrimental. So, coming back to this kind of list of uh, assumptions and properties that we discussed earlier uh, at, at the first part of the course, uh, so uh, this is why I think it's very important to understand that which specific assumptions are needed to prove uh, certain certain properties. So, for example, remember that for the unbiasedness of the estimator exogeneity was enough. So this also highlights the fact that uh, uh, the endogeneity problem is very serious because uh, all of the desirable properties of the OLS estimator fly out of window if the, if the exogeneity property is violated. Whereas homoscedasticity only affects the efficiency of the, of the estimator and asymptotic normality. So asymptotic normality is also, also critical for the uh, for the statistical tests and uh, and stat the confidence intervals and so on. So um, at this point, I want to not just remind you about the link between assumptions and properties, but I also want to highlight you this uh, fact that uh, homoscedasticity assumption and no autocorrelation assumption have very similar role to play in terms of the, the statistical properties of the OLS estimators. I have here pointed out also for sake of uh, uh, to, to be to be precise that the consistency I put in parentheses that no autocorrelation, but I will I will soon also point out that uh, that uh, uh, this assumption can be to some extent uh, relaxed. So what I want to here highlight with this red color text is that uh, no autocorrelation and uh, homoscedasticity assumptions both affect uh, efficiency and asymptotic normality in a very similar way. So in that respect, uh, this is the reason why I paired also this heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation to the same theme, because, uh, because they are from the perspective of the statistical properties of the OLS estimator, they are like, uh, uh, they are like twins in some sense, that they, are, they are very, have very similar effect on the, on the properties, although the content is somewhat uh, different. 
So let me next clarify what is then this autocorrelation. So uh, I look back to the to the lessons of theme number th three, and uh, and in fact I noticed that we didn't explicitly assume uh, anything about uh, autocorrelation. So autocorrelation was actually not mentioned in this uh, list of assumptions, uh, which I actually adopted from uh, Jeff Woolridge's textbook. Okay. But uh, in some sense, autocorrelation is also, also uh, part of this classic uh, Gauss-Markov assumption. So what I want you to highlight here is that autocorrelation has a very similar effect on the statistical properties of the OLS estimator as, as heteroscedasticity. And uh, to briefly clarify the connection also between heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation, uh, I want to um, get a little bit more technical at this point, and I, I introduce you this kind of more general assumption, so-called uh, non-spherical disturbances. And uh, in fact, this uh, non-spherical disturbances, which is here highlighted with red color, it uh, encompasses both heteros, both homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation as a part of the same assumption. So often in more advanced econometrics text, you might find this assumption instead of uh, separate heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation. So what this assumption is stating is in fact that the, the expected value, if we take, uh, take the kind of vector product of, uh, of epsilon, so in effect, we would uh, multiply um, any epsilon, any, any, any term epsilon with other epsilon. So we could take, a, for if it is epsilon i and epsilon i, then it will be epsilon i squared, but it could be also some uh, epsilon j and epsilon i that, that we multiply. So as a result of that, uh, this, uh, this expected value actually uh, results a matrix. So it would be n times n matrix uh, of expected values. And the assumption here states that this, uh, that this uh, variance covariance matrix in some sense is equal to some constant sigma squared multiplied by identity matrix. So I think this is helpful to clarify a little bit to open up what does this uh, what does it mean. So here is the case that uh, that uh, uh, what we actually do assume when we uh, as a part of the classical linear regression model. So when we have homoscedasticity and no autocorrelation, then this variance variance matrix uh, uh, is just. Uh, some constant sigma squared, which is the variance of the of the epsilon, with this is constant, multiplied by identity matrix. So think about first this uh, values of one on the diagonal of the of the matrix. So it just means that the, uh, think about this value of one. First one is the is the variance of the first observation. Second diagonal element is the variance of the second observation, and so on and so on. And the last value of one uh, refers to the variance of the nth observation in the sample. So when the diagonal is equal to one, uh, or diagonal con consists of, of n times uh, one, uh, so there is uh, then the variance of the error term is constant. And these uh, zero elements of the diagonal they refer to this kind of cross product. So if you have epsilon i and epsilon j, for example, epsilon of the first observation and epsilon of the second observation, uh, if, we, if we multiply those epsilons, the expected value is equal to zero. And this is what the off diagonal elements uh, illustrate here. So they are the products of uh, any pair of uh, error terms epsilon. Okay, so then if you think about uh, what would be then the heteroscedasticity, so how this kind of uh, variance covariance matrix would look like if we have a heteroscedasticity problem. So here's an illustration of how the how the heteroscedastic case might uh, might look like. So now the diagonal is no longer consistent of values of one, but then uh, we have something else. So here now the diagonal elements are different. So that would mean that the uh, Variance of the first observation would be 0 0.71 times sigma squared. Uh, variance of the second observation would be 0 0.85 times uh, sigma squared, and so on and so on. And the last one would have uh, 1.93 times the sigma squared. So uh, this would be the case of uh, heteroscedasticity 
one, one example. Uh, notice, however, in the heteroscedastic case, the off-diagonal elements remain equal to zero. Okay? So it's still a diagonal matrix, but the elements on the diagonal are no longer equal to one. So that's the, that's the illustration of heteroscedasticity. Uh, what about autocorrelation then? So autocorrelation then affects similar to this variance-covariance matrix, but now notice that the off-diagonal elements uh, are not equal to zero. So this um, variance-covariance matrix is still symmetric. It has to be symmetric, but, uh, but uh, now autocorrelation affects these off-diagonal elements. So they don't need to be zero anymore. So for example, this uh, value of uh, 0 0.5 in this matrix, uh, that would refer to the, to the expected value of the epsilon for the first observation and epsilon of the second observation. So the product of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, expected value of the product would be 0 0.5. And it doesn't matter in which order we, we take this product, so that's why the variance-covariance matrix is always symmetric, as I have indicated in this example as well. And uh, for the autocorrelation, not all of these off-diagonal elements need to be non-zero. It could be that some of them are still equal to zero. It's enough that, uh, that, uh, that not all of the off-diagonal elements are, are not zero. So some of them may be, may be still zero, but, uh, but there are some non-zero elements in the off-diagonal elements of the variance-covariance matrix. Okay, so this illustrates you that, uh, that how the uh, variance-covariance matrix uh, would look like in the, in the case of if you have autocorrelation, if you have heteroscedasticity. So heteroscedasticity, uh, we have these uh, deviations of one in the diagonal and uh, in the classical case when we have homoscedasticity and autocorrelation, then we have just an identity matrix multiplied by the variance sigma squared. So all, all of the off-diagonal elements are zeros, diagonal elements are equal to one. So I hope that this, uh, this helps you to illustrate that uh, why heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation are kind of uh, two sides of the same coin, and also why this, uh, this relates to the, in some sense, variance of the estimator and particularly efficiency of the OLS estimator and the asymptotic properties, because the standard errors will be affected by these, these two types of violations. So, in the statistical properties of the OLS estimator in the case of autocorrelation is very much uh, similar as that of the, uh, in the case of heteroscedasticity. Uh, one more point I want to just clarify briefly is that, uh, that uh, um, in general, if we have autocorrelation uh, or in least quest estimator, doesn't have to be consistent, but uh, uh, it can be under certain additional assumptions. And for sake of completeness, I have just here one slide to, to clarify that point. So, so, um, uh, so it's possible to show that OLS estimator remains consistent even if there is some, some autocorrelation, but that requires that uh, this, our data of X and then error term epsilon are jointly stationary and uh, ergodic. So er ergodic uh, assumption that uh, that goes beyond the scope of the present, cor present course. Uh, we will talk about stationarity in the context of the time series. So I will, from now on, I will leave this uh, discussion of autocorrelation to the next theme. And um, I just mentioned this uh, uh, very briefly here, you don't need to memorize this by heart or, or necessarily even understand, but the point here is that, uh, that certain type of autocorrelation uh, can be tolerated by OLS and it's still consistent. But uh, if you have some very severe type of autocorrelation, then OLS is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily consistent. So certain additional assumptions are needed to guarantee the consistency of OLS under under autocorrelation. But uh, this is something that we come back to in more detail in the top theme of uh, time series econometrics. And uh, in the next uh, two video lessons, I will then focus on the statistical testing of heteroscedasticity, and then uh, how do we deal with heteroscedasticity if we detect, uh, if our tests are detecting heteroscedasticity problems.
Thanks for your attention.